Well, I hope you enjoyed Hatter's Castle as much as I did. It's a great old melodrama, isn't it? And uh, Robert Newton's rampaging makes it even better. But the whole cast, the whole cast was flawlessly chosen. It is interesting to see Emlyn Williams in there as the shifty Dennis, actually playing exactly the kind of character that he was soon going to be writing. Good evening and welcome to our movie of the week. Tonight, John Hine presents Dudley Moore and Bo Derrick in the comedy Ten. There are people who say that tonight's Blake Edwards comedy called Ten is deep down a serious survey of the male menopause. Others say, of course, that like Hamlet, Ten is about not knowing what you really want, which, come to think of it, is just another description, surely, of the male menopause, although Hamlet was surely much too young for that. But whatever it is deep down about, Ten is still a good movie and often dead funny. Dudley Moore is the maybe menopausal writer of Muzak-style music. He's involved in a middle-aging relationship with Julie Andrews, and he's simply much too nice to deserve the awful serial fate that Blake Edwards' screenplay drops on him. All that Dudley has done is become obsessed with this glorious girl, that's Bo Derrick, obsessed after just one glimpse of her as she drives by on her way to her wedding. Stay with this one tonight. I'll be watching it too for at least the fourth time. It's not a perfect movie, but there are times in it when Dudley and Blake Edwards make me laugh until I cry, literally. I hope it does as much for you too. Well, it's interesting. In fact, to me, it's really fascinating to remember that our Dud only took this role in 10 just at the last minute. It was going to be played by George Siegel of all people and it is a bit fascinating to wonder if Dudley wasn't, as it turned out, wasn't a better piece of casting. It's hard by now, of course, to imagine anyone but Dudley in the role. And of course, if, if George Siegel had gone ahead, the role and the performance still would have been really funny, but it would certainly have been a less complex character, much less of a man on the edge. And Dudley would have had to wait quite a bit longer, probably, for something else that would send his Hollywood career rocketing into orbit the way Ten did. What a shame it is that since Ten, Dudley has been making money by the bucketful, but wasting the best of his talents in what seem to me basically sentimental Hollywood films. Just because he's small and cuddly looking, with a face that at first glance looks so innocent that Hollywood should have seen our dad back in his British television days with Peter Cook when he was really scabrous. I'll be back next Friday night with a comedy from Mel Brooks who's been... Well, this week has been a week dedicated to the Aboriginal people, and so for this Friday night we've programmed Nicholas Rogue's strange and fascinating movie called Walkabout. Well, at first I, I did think that Walkabout was an odd kind of choice for this particular week. After all, it's very much an Anglo-Australian, or really an Anglo-American production, with two English kids as the stars on one side of the equation, it is true that this is well balanced with one truly Australian star on the other. The three stars, by the way, are Jenny Argeter and Lucy and John and the splendid young David Gumpelil. Just the same, Walk About the Film was dreamed up by one of England's greatest cinematographers. That's Nicholas Rogue, of course. He was on a brief first visit to Australia. He was fascinated by the bush. He wanted to make James Vance Marshall's Walk About novel into his very first film as a director but he couldn't raise a skerrick of interest among Australians at that time. He had to make a, a visibly European-type film first to prove himself, a film called Performance, which was a good movie. And then he could make Walkabout, but with American money. The miracle is that this film really worked. The American backers didn't interfere. What Rogue made, well, in 1969, when Walkabout was new, 
The critics saw it then as, as a natural continuation of the old Henry Lawson Banjo Patterson theme of the tensions between the purifying bush and the grim grey city. But as you'll see in just a minute, Walkabout today does seem much more like a, a real parable of that collision of opposites that began 205 years ago and that still waits to be, simply has to be, balanced out somehow, someday. I don't think for a moment that Rogue believed in Walkabout as anything but a wishful parable. In fact, the ending surely says that he didn't. But if only the balancing someday could be so clear and clean and innocent, even while it's so dangerous and strange and fatal, as it is tonight in Walkabout. It's a good movie, isn't it? The three kids are all excellent, especially David Gumperlew, although I've never felt sure about his reaction to the girl's rejection of his dance, but that's the fault of the storyline after all, not his. Jenny Argeter is fine. She was already an established actor, of course. Young Lucy and John, by the way, was Nicholas Rogue's youngest son. I wish that we'd seen more of the admirable John Millian. But anyway, for me, that sad little ending to walk about always creates just enough sense of unreality to confirm, for me anyway, that Rogue is saying that simplicities are beautiful, but they soon do fade into the complexities of time. So it's not the simple picture that it can seem to be, but then as Vincent Canby of the New York Times said at the time, a movie that celebrates life but is framed by suicides is clearly not a simple movie. So think that over during the rest of this week of the Aboriginal people. Next week, a different world, the world of ballet and the frustrations and jealousies that lie behind it. You didn't let me. How not? How not? Well, we've certainly picked up some fancy smancy expressions along the way, haven't we? Dee Dee. I honestly don't know what you're talking about. You don't remember when Michael was choreographing Anna Karenina? Yes, of course I do. And who was he rehearsing for the part of Anna? You and me. And? And? You got pregnant. Yeah. And you got 19 curtain calls. You resent me for that. No, not for that. Oh, would you like to change places? I don't get 19 curtain calls anymore. Anne Bancroft, Shirley MacLaine, Mikhail Barishnikov in The Turning Point. Same time, same station, next Friday night. See you then. So, Rosebud. The key piece in a jigsaw puzzle of money and power, time and tempest, love and no love, of that great, uneasy American dream where some loved but forgotten something becomes lost always among a mountain of great possessions. Wells himself once said that this was, quote, a portrait of a public man's private life. And public men don't love this film at all. That mogul among all moguls, Hollywood's own Lewis B. Mayer, once offered RKO Studios the full cost of Citizen Kane if they would destroy it. And that is a horrible thought. Sometimes people want to give the credit for Citizen Kane to its writer, Herman Mankiewicz. And it is a great screenplay too, but then the music from Bernard Herman, the editing by that great team of Robert Wise and Mark Robson, the cameras, the set making, they were all wonderful. It was still Orson Welles that put the whole thing